Hey guys, back again. Um, I got a little, another little railing tutorial for you. I've got all my railing and my posts installed. So I'm doing, starting some finish work now. Um, there's a few different ways to do it. You see some guys uh, run the railing but leave the post sticking up and then do a post cap on top. I think that's kind of a cool look. I personally prefer the cap rail though. Um, this cap rail will run the entire length of the railing and it just gives you kind of a, a surface to lean on and, um, you, you know, a usable railing system. Um, that's kind of my personal preference. That's what these people decided to do as well. So I want to show you a few things, uh, with cap rail and you're like, Nick, I'm never going to install cap rail. Or if I do, it's going to be once a year, so I don't really need to know this information. But the same principles for this process can be applied to baseboard, exterior trim, um, crown molding, you name it. Um, that's, uh, that's what I want to show you. This, it's pretty rare that I have to splice a section of railing. Um, I get decking in 24 foot or 20 foot sticks. And that's usually long enough to cover any side of a deck. Um, this is a pretty large project, obviously. So I do have to splice this section of cap rail. Um, and that's what I want to go over with you today. Um, I'm going to walk down the that railing there and let you kind of look at it. You will be able to see the splice, but it's, it's not going to be super noticeable. Um, You'll be able to see it if you look for it, though. This is not fastened down. It's just clamped in there. But I'm going to run down here real quick. and When you see it, pause the video and learn something, you know. I couldn't see it on my phone. I know where it is, but I couldn't even see it on my phone. So I'll walk a little slower. So you can't see it, but you really got to look for it, right? This is just clamped in, it's not fastened. Um, it's, like I said, it's pretty rare that I have to splice something on a cap rail. Um, there's a few, in a perfect world, honestly, this splice would land on a post, because I'm going to be able to fasten it better that way. Um, I've got all my tools and stuff set up downstairs, so I'll run down there and give you the rest of the tutorial. But in a perfect world, this splice would land on a post. The problem with doing that is that a splice is inherently a, a weak point. Um, there's no such thing as a perfect splice. And over time, they do kind of tend to pull out of place. So the fewer splices I have, the better. In other words, in order to land on a post, I would have one splice and then two splice. I would rather have one in the middle, even though it's not an ideal spot for it, at least there's only one of them. So I got all my tools set up down there. This is, this is the challenge, this is the scenario. Let me show you how I'm doing that. So you got, this piece is kind of sitting right in the sun, isn't it? There you go. So you got three different scenarios here. I need to do a splice, and in a perfect world, it's landing on a post, right? So option one is just a, a butt splice, right? I'm just going to cut that material square and shoot a screw through both sides of that material. The obvious problem with this is that over time, that square cut will start to open up. You get water in there, they'll separate. Um, and even, even on day one, it's really hard to get two pieces 
of material that's cut square. It's really hard to get them to marry up perfectly. So most guys will do a little bevel on that piece of material just to splice it. So this, this side is actually holding down this other side. So it kind of keeps that from lifting up. Um, a, a, a good trick for installing that, if this is this side right here, is actually to set up your other piece of material slightly above it, like that, um, where to where it's kind of overlapping that corner. And then once you fasten this, that's going to suck this corner down as tight as possible. Um, and that's what I did up there. I just got it clamped. But that's the technique that I'm using. And that's why it, that splice is really hard to notice. Is because I picked it up and over a little bit and then clamped it down to where it's actually compressed into that other piece of material. So in terms of angle, this... This first side here, I kind of marked out at a 45 degree angle. This other example, I've made a shallower cut, and I want to show you pros and cons either way. This 45 is going to get you a cleaner, um, a cleaner seam on the top, but the problem is you've you've created some really thin material here. So if I run a fastener right through the middle. I'm barely catching anything on either side, right? And the seam looks nice, but that fastener is barely catching anything. Um, if I go, if I skip the fastener in the middle and I go on either side of it, um, my seam is potentially not going to be as tight as I want it to be. So I prefer to use a shallower bevel. I'm using 22.5 degrees. There's a positive stop on a miter saw for that, um, and that's actually, well, it's the miter for a 45 degree wall, um, but it's also useful for um, stuff like this. You can, you can use it in crown molding, but that's kind of a different, that's a different process, and there's some other stops on your saw that are useful for that. I prefer the 22.5 method. It still gets me most, mostly a butt joint, right? It's, it has the strength, if this is your material, it has, a, has the strength of a butt joint because you're running a fastener through that whole chunk of material. But it has the advantage of covering up that splice with an angle. It's just a shallower angle than a 45, for example. So I personally prefer a 22.5. That's, that's pretty industry standard. Most carpenters will tell you that if they have to splice uh, trim or anything like that, they're, they're doing 22.5 on their saw. That's pretty standard. Um, and, that, and like I said, the reason for it is when you run a fastener through here, you're actually catching a fair bit of meat on both sides of that splice versus just catching the very tip of a 45 if that makes sense um, I do I add a little twist to it as well though I'll cut my um, I'll cut my short side at 22.5 but I actually cut my long side right here I cut that at about 22.7. Um, so what, what happens with the splice, if you zoom in on it, I've got one side at 22.5 and one side at 22.7. And obviously the gap is not gonna be that extreme. I'm exaggerating it just so you can get the idea. Um, so what happens when you do that is that you get rid of material on the bottom of this piece that would potentially um, interfere with getting a really tight seam on the top. The top is what I'm after. That's what you're going to see. You know. Um, so I get rid of some extra material on this side on the bottom. Just so that top is pinched down tight. Let me, uh, I'm going to pause this real quick. I'll, 
I'll run back up there and zoom in on the on the side of that splice just so you can see what I'm Alright, I'm back on top here. This is my splice right there. You can you can see it when I zoom in. Obviously it's tight up here. But like I was saying down there, I do have a very slight gap at the bottom of that splice. It's not a lot, like you're not setting your miter saw a full degree off. It's 22.5 over here and 22.7 on this side. So it's not even a full tick mark. Um, but just having that little gap on the bottom of the splice helps make sure that the top is going to pinch down flat all the way across. Um, so let's go back to the, the drawing board there. And... Alright, so we're back down here. Um, like I said at the beginning of the video, you might be thinking, you know, Nick, I'm not really doing cap rail on decks. Um, and it's pretty rare that I got to splice it anyways. And I would agree with you. I, I've had to do it maybe four or five times on a deck. But with interior stuff like baseboard or or trim or crown molding or exterior trim, like the trim around your windows, your soffit, you're going to end up splicing pretty much everything in the house because it's all over 20 foot. Um, so that's where this technique comes in. Right now I'm putting a cap rail flat onto a vertical post. But if you turn this whole assembly on its side, it becomes baseboard fastened into a stud. Um, and if you turn it vertically, it becomes house trim fastened into your framing. So this is actually pretty useful information for a lot of different things. If you're doing, so let's say you're doing interior trim, right? And you got a stud, there's your stud. In a perfect world, your short side of that material lands on the stud, right? And your long side overlaps it, and you'll just run one fastener, or one row of fasteners, I guess, through the baseboard and into the stud. And you only need one, because that, that's going to suck that top piece down tight enough to pull the other side in with it. Um, and that's fine for interior stuff. The problem with exterior, the main difference, the obvious difference, is that exterior stuff is exposed. So if I just do the one fastener through the middle, there's a really good chance that that's going to deteriorate over time. So especially on cap rail, where, I mean, even house trim is, is vertical. So when it gets rained on, you know, if you got a piece of trim here and it's spliced right there, when it gets rained on, that rain is just going to drip right down it. When your cap rail on your deck gets rained on, it literally just sits right on top of it. So over time, what happens is that these ends tend to pick up and away from each other. They'll start to curl up and out. Um, my, here, here's a good example. My fascia is not... I'm not quite to the point of doing fascia yet, but it's been sitting out here for a few weeks now. And that's what it does, you know? And obviously I've got some waste on all these boards and I've got tricks to flatten them out if I really need the whole piece of material. But that is what that material tends to do when it's exposed. Um, even with a screw in it, that's gonna slow the process, but it's not gonna stop it completely. So the, the challenge here is to get a nice clean splice, right? But because it's exterior, I'm not really inclined to do the one nail right through the middle. I do want to support both sides. The main problem with this particular project is that my splice does not land on a post. And that's what I showed you. I got a post over here and a post over here, and then I got a splice in the middle right so there's really no way to shoot a fastener on either side of that I do have railing clips that fasten on the underside of the railing and screw into the bottom of the cap rail um, and that's a pretty nice piece of hardware but I don't necessarily trust it to hold this splice in place over time so this is actually new for me. It's something that I learned on this job. Never done it before. I 
picked up a doweling jig actually and I ran a couple dowels into my splice this is obviously a, t a test piece um, I've never done that before but on this job specifically just because I couldn't land that splice on a post that kind of made me nervous and I was like I really want to get some extra meat in there the I use steel I, you could probably use wood but you know for a couple bucks at Home Depot you could you might as well just use some steel. Um, I had this stuff laying around in the shop. I don't even know what it's from, but just some scrap round. Uh, this is a doweling jig that I picked up on Amazon. It's like 20 bucks. Um, the machining on that particular unit was not great. Um, it got the job done, but I'm actually probably gonna invest in a higher quality doweling jig. I'll probably spend a hundred bucks or so on on something more precise. Um, for this job it'll it'll do the trick but um, so I'm gonna press these two together just so you can see it. So I got some gapage right there but when I actually push on it that closes up. My installed piece is a little is a little more precise obviously but that's the idea that's what I'm doing um, just get those separated obviously, obviously they're in there pretty tight took a little bit of effort to separate them and that's and that's really what I'm after um, on this splice I don't the fasteners help you know, but I want that material actually locked in here as well. Um, so that's what I did on this, this project. Um, what else was I going to tell you guys? I think that about covers it. I am, I am going to make another video with this process about combo square. I talked to you a little bit about it in my measuring video. Um, I'm going to show you a couple tricks specifically for railing that uses a combo square and then at some point on this job I'm actually going to make a little tutorial video dedicated to a combo square. It's actually one of my all-time favorite tools. I mean even over my impact drivers and miter saw I I gotta rank a combo square above any of those things. Like a miter saw is a great tool but if I don't have a way to measure or mark what I'm cutting it's just a really fast way of destroying material <laughs> but with a combo square that miter saw becomes a really precise power tool right um, so I think that covers it for today this is uh, how to make a splice and you can use it for your baseboard your exterior trim anything like that um, that's that's the other thing I was going to tell you. If you're doing interior trim, you'll see most guys just do the one row of fasteners, one, two, or three, depending on, you know, the height of your baseboard and if you're catching the floor plate or whatever. Um, usually just two or three, though, in a line, straight up and down, and they're just doing it on that one stud. The If you're doing paint grade, there is more room for, for error or for slop because you can caulk it and paint it afterwards and it's going to hide all your mistakes. But if you're doing stain grade, where that wood is going to be, you can use wood filler, but wood filler stands out like a sore thumb. Um, if you don't know what you're doing, you know, there is an art to that as well. You know, if you're a good painter, you can, you can hide it up. You can cover it up pretty well. But most of the time, wood putty is going to have a different texture, a different color than the, the trim you're actually using. So with stain grade, you don't have that wiggle room. It's got to be a perfect splice the first time and fasten correctly. The same is true on decking. I can't caulk and paint this. It's, it's textured and it's variegated colors. So there's brown and black and tan and all that in there. I can't caulk that and paint it. 
whatever I install needs to be perfect the way it is and it needs to stay there. So that's kind of the challenge. This is how I overcome it. Dowling jig I've never tried before. Um, this is the first time I'm a, I've ever done this on a job. Um, I like the idea, like I said, this particular piece is a little sloppy on the machine work. Some of the threads are not perfectly centered. So I had to fiddle with it a little bit to get it where I want it. Um, but it's a cool idea um, and something that I will probably do more of in the future. Just having that piece of steel to hold that splice together. Anyways, um, hope you guys learned something this afternoon, I guess, when I get to that point. I'm going to give you some combo square stuff, too. Um, something for you to chew on. and Cap rail splices, that's all pretty specific to trim work. But a combo square you can use for pretty much anything you can imagine. You can use it to stir your coffee in the morning, too, if you want. So, always nice to have one of those on you. Alright, guys, I'll talk to you soon. Bye.